I'll just go ahead and skip right here. My name is Allison Cousins. I'm a Parks and Recreation Management Master's student out of Northern Arizona University. Um, graduating in April, hooray. But I do live here in the Raleigh area. I've been here for about five years. Um, most of the work that I've done in my master's has been about prescribed fire in general, um, the history of fire, some uh, fire ecology, the benefits of prescribed fire, and then largely the importance of education and outreach in regards to prescribed fire, which is kind of what brought me to this project and working with the city of Raleigh. Um, I have a little bit of insight because I am a former employee of the city of Raleigh. I did some outdoor recreation and nature programming there for um, probably about a year pre-COVID. So I knew that the city was planning on moving forward with um, implementing prescribed fire and incorporating prescribed fire into the land management plans of the parks and preserves and city limits. Um, so I reached out to Sean Goff, who is the land steward program manager with the city, and Julia, obviously, who's the manager at the Thomas Crowder Woodland Center, and talked to them about partnering and maybe providing some education outreach before moving forward with doing a lot of these prescribed fires. I think it's really important, especially in a city, a densely populated area, to talk to the community about fire before you actually put it on the ground. Um, there's kind of this overarching perception of fire um, as a negative thing, kind of a dangerous thing, maybe hurts wildlife, that we're kind of trying to change that perception now and how we do that is through education and outreach. So that's kind of where I am right now working with them. I was hoping this lecture was going to be a little bit different. Um, we had planned and wanted to already have a prescribed fire done at Lake Johnson Park before delivering this lecture. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened yet this year. Um, it still might be in the cards to happen this year. We kind of wanted it to be done by the middle of April. It could be that we have a really good burn day in between now and then, but we're kind of leaning on it happening next year at this point. But what I wanted was to show you guys how that burn went and give you some footage of the burn from the perspective of a fire manager and kind of what it looked like before, during, and maybe shortly after the prescribed fire. But instead, we'll have to hold on for that one to um, happen within the next couple of weeks or months or maybe even next year. So instead, I put together this lecture, um, and I tried to incorporate a lot of the things that people have been asking me and concerns that I felt like have been um, kind of across the board while I've been providing some of this education and outreach and put it into this lecture um, and clear up some of the concerns that people have. I do really hope that you guys have questions for me and ask them at the end. We'll leave a couple of minutes for that because I can't... Um, I can only anticipate so much and I think it's totally normal for you guys to have concerns and there be, um, you know, some controversy in the media about wildfire and prescribed fire. So I'd like to clear that up here. Oh, how do I go to the next one? Okay, so very general, what is prescribed fire? Um, prescribed fire is the planned use of fire under predetermined weather and fuel parameters to obtain specific management objectives. That is the definition that is given to us by the North Carolina Forest Service. The North Carolina Forest Service is kind of the overarching agency that um, oversees and manages all prescribed fire in the uh, state of North Carolina. So they have a lot of resources on their web page and through their agency for landowners who might want to burn or people who are interested in getting certified to do their own burns. They have fire weather forecasts up there and then you submit all of your prescribed fire plans or your prescriptions to the Forest Service and they approve them and you put your burn permits in through the Forest Service. So if you ever have any questions about them, that is the agency that you would reach out to for resources. Um, and this definition is kind of exactly what it sounds like. What it's getting at is that prescribed fire is planned and it's purposeful. It's not as simple as Maybe understanding that an area or an ecosystem would benefit from fire, it's understanding and writing down and planning that fire a little bit more meticulously than that. Um, that fire should be predictable and it should all be written into your prescribed fire plan. So a prescribed fire manager will go out and talk to the landowner, whoever it is, about what exactly they want to accomplish from that fire. And then they will make this really specific burn plan that best meets those objectives while also considering public safety and smoke management and the ways that they can accomplish that the most efficiently. So that's kind of the basic definition. But what you need to know is that 
prescribed fire is planned and predictable. And then some more general stuff, the benefits of, uh, benefits of prescribed fire. This is by no means an exhaustive list. It's kind of just sort of the big ticket items here. Um, so disease and insect kill is a big one that I encounter personally, and I have a lot of anecdotal evidence of. Um, I work with a forestry company, Wildland Forestry and Environmental, and we do prescribed fires, but we also do a lot of habitat restoration stuff. And in sites that I go out on that have not been burned in the past couple of years, I come home and I kid you not, I'll be pulling ticks off of me all night. I know it's kind of gross, but it's sort of a little bit of the nature of the job. However, I started noticing and talking with um, my boss about it and realizing that areas that we've burned that we're working in or during prescribed fires, I come home and I don't have any on me. And it's just this really black and white stark contrast that I've been able to see. And I looked into it a little bit and I, I don't have any citations for these studies, but they are out there that it can reduce tick populations on a site that's been burned by like 80%. And that's probably the season right after the fire, but up to five years, you're getting that really big benefit of reduced tick populations. We do a lot of burns where the main objective is tick kill um, for hunting properties and people who uh, lease their properties for hunters. So that's kind of just a cool one that people don't think about as much. I'm gonna move down here to site prep. So site prep burn is probably not a kind of burn that you would encounter here in the city of Raleigh. This is something that happens typically after a timber harvest. Um, Following a timber harvest, the loggers will leave behind what we call slash, and this is just the leftover vegetation, um, the trees that didn't make it into the harvest. And that can get really, really dangerous um, because that provides a lot of really heavy fuel that contributes to wildfires if it does um, somehow ignite by lightning or whatever. Um, so part of these site prep burns are always going to be hazard reduction and reducing the fuel loads there, but also it prepares that site for either another, for planting either another stand that people are going to be using to harvest, or maybe um, they're replacing a stand. So sometimes we'll do site prep burns after a loblolly stand is harvested and a landowner has decided that they're not gonna use that for commis uh, commercial timber anymore. They wanna restore it into a native prairie or something like that. So we'll burn all of that slash that's left behind. And it actually, makes the nutrient or the soil a lot more nutritious. It converts dead fuel um, and nutrients in dead fuel into more available forms. So that also kind of goes into this improved seed bed. So as you can see, a lot of these benefits kind of play on each other. They're not independent at all. Usually you kind of get a mix of them when you're doing a prescribed fire, but Improved seed bed happens mostly because if you look at what our forests look like right now, instead of seeing mineral soil on the forest floor, we're really seeing more like vegetation or dead fuel that's building up. So pine litter, hardwood litter, and things like that, that are, you know, maybe an inch or two covering the forest floor. So a prescribed fire will burn all of that and provide a condition for a seed to germinate because right now a bird may fly over and drop a seed, but it lands on that, um, on that fuel instead of in that mineral soil and it can't germinate on that fuel it has to be in mineral soil it also needs sunlight so we can use prescribed fire not only to take back some of that fuel but also reduce the amount of mid-story so that's the kind of the mid-level stuff in the forest um, you know saplings and briars and things like that that are shading out the forest floor so we're, uh, we're kind of creating these conditions that's really conducive to um, vegetation establishment by allowing sunlight to hit the forest floor a little bit more warmth because we're um you know allowing that sunlight to hit and even moisture with rainfall and things like that and then a more nutritious soil as well native vegetation establishment goes hand in hand with that so with the prescribed fire we are oftentimes targeting invasive species or just species that are not really ecologically appropriate for the site that we are burning so i know sometimes we're burning um fields that are infested by fescue. That's something that the city of Raleigh has started exploring recently actually, or different kind of invasives can be managed with prescribed fire and that leaves more room for that native uh, plant and vegetation to establish. So all of those things together create this um, overarching like habitat improvement. So these native plants that are coming in, the grasses and wildflowers and things like that, instead of 
just dead vegetation on the forest floor create a much better habitat for most animals. Um, and I want to debunk a myth really quickly that I've seen kind of over and over again in my studies is that one of the major concerns that people have when they think about prescribed fire is the impact that it has on the wildlife that's in that, um, that burn unit. So I think maybe we don't give enough uh, credit to animals for how much more mobile they are than us. Um, they're faster than us generally. They can fly, they can burrow, they can swim. They will generally get away from prescribed fire way before it ever reaches them. They also have these heightened senses. They will feel the heat. They will smell it before we would. Um, it would be a lie to tell you that no single rodent dies in a prescribed fire, but generally populations of animals do better in areas that have been subject to frequent low intensity fire. Um, in other anecdotes in my time working with prescribed fire, I've been pretty amazed to see um, the things that they do. I've seen turtles seek out really moist areas and puddles and kind of hide out in there, or I will find some kind of animal in just like a really, really small unburned section because it's a little bit more wet than the rest of the fuel. So they are pretty adaptive to fire. And I don't want to say that they necess necessarily expect it, but I think that they um, are better equipped to handle it than we think that they are. And then hazard reduction too, that's just a quick thing. That's kind of a back pocket objective or benefit to every prescribed fire that we do. Um, there's been about a hundred years, which I'll get into the timeline of fire where we've had no fire on the forest floor and that's created these really, really heavy fuel loads. There's unnatural amount of vegetation on the forest floor that's dead and dry. So by burning some of that in a controlled way, in that predictable way, and we know what we're doing, we're reducing the threat of wildfire later. So if a lightning struck came and it started a fire in an area that just saw a prescribed fire three or five years ago, well, it's only got like an inch worth of dead vegetation to burn instead of maybe six inches or a foot worth of ve uh, vegetation to burn. And it's a lot more manageable and controllable. Um, a lack of prescribed fire is one of the main reasons we're seeing these really, really big wildfires that are happening in the West. But also here too, we had those big fires in 2007, 2016 in Gatlinburg. And those were in ecosystems that naturally probably would have seen fire anywhere from every five years and then in more specific places every 30 years, but it had actually been a hundred years since they had burned it all. So there's just this really unnatural amount of um, hazardous flammable fuel in um, all of these places. So doing prescribed fire can be a really cheap, safe way to reduce the hazard and threat of wildfire later. Okay, so here's that timeline I was talking about. Um, one of the main takeaways here is that fire is a natural key disturbance. It's one of the four elements. It has existed as long as there was fuel to burn and sufficient oxygen and heat to burn that fuel. Before human inhabitation, um, this was primarily done through lightning strikes, but it also could have been something like a rock slide creating a spark. Um, and that's something that we see in the West too, when it gets really, really dry, even just that spark from a rock slide could create a wildfire. Um, but moving forward, this is a really big era that I have kind of all clumped into one, the Paleo-Indian, which is the earliest humans through indigenous Americans. Um, and this is where we saw the most fire that the United States particularly has ever seen. So basically ever since humans have existed, they have been domesticating fire and using it for their own personal purposes. Um, they shaped our fire regime that we have here in the Southeast today, which is a frequent low intensity fire. So at any given point, fire could be happening over some swath of land and again and again. Um, and they shaped our ecosystems too. We have all of these fire dependent and fire adapted ecosystems that occur and have, um, I guess, developed due to this long period of a lot of fire being put on the ground. So indigenous Americans use fire for a lot of different reasons. One of the big reasons that pretty much across all the cultures in that entire timeline use fire was for hunting purposes. Um, they would use fire to push animals out of an area and make them easy targets. They would also use it to ring animals in. That kind of made their job a little bit easier too. They use it for agriculture in a lot of the same ways modern um, farmers use it for agriculture too. They would burn down areas 
that they would plant on um, and make gardens out of that they could use for food, for food or um, producing baskets or things like that. Um, they also used it for travel. So they would burn down corridors in the woods. And then once they did that, they would actually um, build their villages on areas that they had previously burned. So they had this knowledge of kind of fire safing their villages. So in the event of a wildfire, they already did that hazard reduction strategy and it kept them a little bit safer. And they had sacred practices as well. They used it for cooking food in the same way that we do too. But I want to give credit to them too, that they had really, really deep ecosystem knowledge also. They were using fire in some of the ways that we're just learning how to use fire um, in ecosystem restoration. They kind of saw the effects of fire in maintaining ecosystems that they used to hunt in. They saw that it produced more berries and things like that. So they had a pretty deep knowledge of prescribed fire um, and used it for a lot of reasons. So European settlement happened from the 1500s, 80s to the 1920s. Early European settlers adapted a lot of these practices from um, indigenous Americans, and they were using it for hunting and agriculture mainly. Um, but as we reduce the population of indigenous Americans, we also reduce the amount of fire that was happening on the ground. Um, and then moving forward a little bit into European settlement in the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, we saw a different kind of fire happening. So this is when timber became really, really um, valuable. And we were harvesting really, really large swaths of land, primarily in the wilderness. And we had locomotives that were also um, causing sparks in these areas that they were going to to harvest the timber. So this created some really, really dangerous wildfire conditions. So we have this lack of fire, this well, I should say a lack of natural fire, that low intensity fire, and it was being replaced with standard placing fire, these uncharacteristically large, really hard to control wildfires that kind of mirror what we're seeing today from fire exclusion, um, but they were largely because of poor logging policies. So today we do those site prep burns or those slash burns, um, where after a harvest, we have things that we have to do to make sure that it is safe and we are taking care of that slash, and we largely do it through burning. They weren't doing it then, so instead they were just having hundreds of acres of this really, really dangerous um, fuel on the forest floor that would inevitably ignite from lightning or a spark or anything like that and create these really, really damaging wildfires. So that kind of catapulted this fire exclusion era of the 1920s. In the early 1910s, there was a series of fire called the Big Blow Up. They burned millions of acres in about three days in Idaho. Wyoming and Montana. Um, they were not the only fires by any means, but they were the ones that really kind of broke the camel's back and led us into this fire exclusion. During this time, there was virtually no fire being put on the ground at all, and that includes wildfires and prescribed fires. The primary focus of the U.S. Forest Service during this time was fire exclusion, prevention, and suppression. In the 1970s, the Forest Service kind of acknowledged that they were wrong for a little while. And not only that um, prescribed fire was not detrimental to ecosystems, it actually was really beneficial to a lot of ecosystems. And so that was kind of the changing of our management of our forests and what we're trying to reincorporate now and where we are now with prescribed fire and fire management. So this slide is kind of just a dedication to the transition between the fire exclusion era and modern management. Um, so those 1910 fires and those catastrophic wildfires that were happening during um, the early 1900s, they were dangerous. They were bad for wildlife because those standard placing fires are no good. That's what we see in the West that actually are really, really damaging. But the U.S. Forest Service um, had other concerns. They framed this anti-fire propaganda as being, you know, damaging to wildlife and whatnot. But what they cared about a little bit more was actually that these big fires were destroying valuable timber. And that's really where their um, concern lied. But then they actually changed the message a little bit to have people perceive fire as being damaging to wildlife. So it was a little bit misleading, but it definitely worked in excluding fire and shaping people's perception. 
So this anti-fire propaganda era or this fire exclusion paradigm that happened for about 100 years in the early 1900s started with Bambi. So the U.S. Forest Service borrowed Bambi for about a year. Um, everybody can remember that really tragic scene in the beginning of the Bambi movie where her mother dies in a wildfire. And you can see here in the ad that, you know, please, mister, don't be careless and preventing forest fires really, really um, appeals to people. So this anthropomorphized family friendly character was really successful. Um, and so the U.S. Forest Service kind of ran with it. That contract ended a year later, and that's when Smokey Bear was born. So this over here is the first Smokey Bear ad ever. It says Carol prevent nine out of 10 woods fires. I chose to include this one because I think it was the most extreme Smokey ad that I could find, but it really demonstrates the, I guess, hmm, how do I put this? The appeal that it had and the way that it shaped people's perception. So this is a really sad, image um they designed smoky to appeal to people's religious moral sentiments to family values to wildlife and it was really successful um he is the longest running most expensive and most successful campaign of the u.s for or the u.s government ever and he is still running today but another thing that's important with smoky is that he um he put blame or responsibility, I should say, on the American people in preventing and suppressing wildfires. So, you know, Smokey says care is going to prevent and everyone can remember that, you know, only you can prevent forest fires. He created this feeling that it's on the American people and it's this patriotic thing to make sure that fire is not a part of our ecosystems. So not only did he place fear in the people and shape their perceptions of how they should perceive fire, he also, um, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say he outlawed fire, but the U.S. Forest Service outlawed fire. They called it light burning before it was called prescribed fire. And that started with um, just refusing to fund states that allowed prescribed fire or light burning and then turned into the complete outlaw of any prescribed fire efforts. Um, Smokey has a little bit of a different message today. His campaign is still focused on preventing wildfires, but you can see his language has changed. This is from the early 2010s, where he says wildfires instead of forest fires. So it's a small feat, but that is kind of Smokey's nod at prescribed fire and the importance of fire in some ecosystems. Um, they still keep the message separate, but there is, they're working towards a distinguishment between the use of good fire and the prevention of wildfires. The most recent, I guess, um, mascot with prescribed fire is Burner Bob right here. He is the mascot of the Longleaf Alliance, and he is a bobwhite quail. So he is a game bird species that lives in the Longleaf Pine ecosystem, which is a really, really fire-dependent ecosystem. And his slogan is a cool dude with a hot message, and he is... Um, his goal is to provide public outreach and education and shed light on the use of prescribed fire and how it actually benefits wildlife. So he's Smokey's complete counterpart. The federal government has recognized Burner Bob recently. The National Prescribed Fire Act of 2020 is this con uh, act of Congress that wants to expand the use of prescribed fire and allocates funds to expand the use of prescribed fire mostly for hazard reduction, um, but they have a little section in there that is dedicated to Burner Bob and acknowledging the power of a mascot, this anthropomorphized animal, in shaping people's perception of prescribed fire. So they are working on getting him a little bit more in the limelight. So I'm hoping maybe I would love to see Smokey and Burner Bob partner up and maybe put out like a mixed message together. Um, and maybe that's going to happen in the future. Right now, they're trying to keep it separate still. But hopefully, we'll see more of him um, maybe taking over some of the media and changing the message that is put out about prescribed fire. OK, so changing gears a little bit. This is a really, really basic model of the steps of succession in a temperate, deciduous forest. So. What's important to note here is that this is how a forest will succeed in the absence of a critical disturbance like a fire. So at any given point, we should be having areas that are in every single stage of succession. 
with a lack of fire and without these key disturbances, our ecosystems are all kind of trending towards this climax forest, which is no good for us. We need to have early successional habitats. We need to have mature oak and hickory. Um, and here's where you would find your pines and things like that too. So we're losing these kinds of ecosystems because we're they're just continuously succeeding when really we should be pushing them back and we should have different stages of succession at all times. So that brings me to the fire adapted ecosystems, which I've talked a little bit about. Um, most of the Southeast has fire adapted ecosystems. The Southeast would have seen more fire than the rest of the country um, in the absence of fire exclusion, if that makes any sense. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, an exhaustive list of fire adapted ecosystems. It's just some key ones that I think are important for right here in the Raleigh area, more or less. Um, I'm going to start here with the longleaf pine ecosystem because that's like a really hot topic in um, prescribed fire management. So longleaf pine ecosystem is the most fire dependent ecosystem in the United States. It relies on a one to three year fire return interval. It's a very, very dry ecosystem. Longleaf pines have really, really long pine needles that are conducive to fire because not only are they flammable, but they carry fire across an ecosystem or across um, an area, I could say. So this ecosystem is made up of pretty much primarily mature longleaf pines. There's no midstory at all, and then there's a wire grass understory. In the absence of fire, this succeeds into a hardwood forest, um, and that's because longleaf pines in their first three years of life grow really, really slow. They live in this grass stage that is basically just like one or two feet tall. It looks like a bunch of grass. And other trees like hardwoods, um, grow way faster than the longleaf pine. So they outcompete it in the absence of fire. But when fire does roll through this kind of ecosystem, those grass stage longleaf pines are protected because they have these really, really long needles. And in the middle of them is that bud. So even if they do burn over, typically that bud is protected. And they have some other cool fire adaptations. Also, they self prune their branches. That is eliminating the threat of fire rolling across the overstory here and turning into one of those standard placing fires that would kill the trees. So mature trees, longleaf pines in general, really aren't hurt by fire. Um, and then the other thing that you should know about that is that this is one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the entire world. It's about as biodiverse as the Amazon rainforest, but unfortunately, it's also one of the most endangered. So. It used to be the primary ecosystem in definitely the sand hills, coastal plain, a little bit of the um, Piedmont and covered about 90 million acres, about 4% of that remains. And we're losing a lot of those endangered species that live in that ecosystem at all um, as well. But there's been a lot of efforts to put fire back in that ecosystem. That is actually probably the ecosystem that catapulted the end of the fire exclusion era because people were realizing the loss of um, the longleaf pine ecosystem. So the next one up here is this Piedmont Prairie. So back in the day, the uh, Piedmont would have been, you would have seen a lot more of these prairies in the Piedmont. It would have been maybe not the primary ecosystem, but a really, really common one. Um, this is an early successional habitat. So this is the one that we're losing really, really easily when we don't have fire on the ground. After only about three to five years, we start losing prairies and they start succeeding into like shrubs and then um, a forest. So this makes a really, really good pollinator habitat. It has a lot of good food resources for animals. And this one is also on the decline um, without fire on the ground. And this last one is a mixed oak hickory ecosystem. This is the one that um, we're planning on putting fire on at Lake Johnson Park. It is definitely not as bare as a longleaf pine ecosystem in its midstory. It does have a little bit more density in shrubs and things like that coming up. But this had a fire return interval of somewhere between five and 15 years. So in the absence of that fire, it is succeeding into that more mesic kind of um, habitat with sweet gums and sugar maples and beaches. And that changes the composition of the forest altogether. Those are moisture loving trees. That's what music means. Um, and they don't provide a lot of good food resources for animals. Oaks and hickories do because they produce acorns and hickories, which are really good seeds that animals feed on. The sweet gums and maples and beaches, they don't they don't drop those kinds of seeds. So it's host to a different kind of animal than what would be, you would usually find in that dry upland mixed oak hickory um, habitat. 
And then the other thing to note here with both of these forest stands that in general in the southeast, our forests are too dense due to partially due to a lack of fire. Um, people are understandably upset when we talk about killing trees because we love trees. However, the reality of it is that there are more trees than is what than what is natural in the southeast. It's actually really beneficial to do some selective thinning, especially of the trees that don't belong in a place um, like an upland mixed oak hickory. Um, and just opening up the forest makes it better for animals because they are like us. They don't want to travel through thick briars and they can't see either. It makes them harder. It makes it harder for them to hunt and forage. So the big takeaway here is that there are too many trees and fire is one way to manage that. Okay, so changing over to kind of Lake Johnson specific things. So the fire that we had planned on doing, we're still planning on doing um, at Lake Johnson is that upland mixed oak hickory stand. It is a small unit, it's only two acres. It's just southeast of the Magnolia Cottage. It has eight foot lines all the way around it. That equals about 0.2 miles. Um, I have these little characters here for when because like I said, we hope that it would happen this year, but it's really, really hard to plan a prescribed fire and schedule a prescribed fire because there's a lot of moving parts. So this year it was really, really wet winter. Um, we had a lot of rain, which we can't get fire on the ground, especially in a primarily hardwood stand because it's a little bit wetter in nature. Um, but there's other pieces to this puzzle at all, um, as well. So the city of Raleigh doesn't have their own fire staff or anything like that. We are relying on the Forest Service. So we're relying on this burn window actually happening and then agency coordination as well. The Forest Service likely has a lot of units that kind of got left behind this year because it was really wet. So it makes it challenging to get them on board on a day when we have enough staff and the burn window is good. So it makes sense for us to have to wait a year and that's kind of just the nature of prescribed fire is unpredictability and flexibility because we can't really schedule these things. You just have to be on it and ready to show up to work when the conditions are right. So the prescription is one of the things that does make it hard to schedule prescribed fires, but it's also a really, really important document in terms of prescribed fire. It is the document that you submit to the Forest Service that has literally every piece of information that you could ever imagine having to do with this prescribed fire. So a fire manager will go to the unit and they will discuss with the landowner or whoever it is about what their specific objectives are. Um, and then they will write this plan with public safety and smoke management as priority, but also in a way that would best meet those land management objectives. So they can do that through choosing their firing techniques if they want to go a little bit more aggressive with it and put more fire on the ground or maybe they just want to put one line of fire and let it slowly back over it different kinds of techniques and firing um, techniques can kind of change the way the fire behaves and ultimately reach objectives weather and smoke management go hand in hand I think they're one of the probably most important and specific aspects of a um, prescription so Smoke management basically means that you have to look at your unit and then you have to zoom out and you have to find all of the smoke sensitive areas that are around your unit and what is appropriate and what is not appropriate to send smoke towards. So here at Lake Johnson, we have I-40 that's pretty close to our unit and then we have some residences like apartment complexes that's really close to our unit too. So we have to go and write our burn plan in a way that ensures that we're not going to pick a day that the wind is going to send smoke towards I-40. That would be unsafe for us to smoke out I-40. Instead, you have to decide that this burn is only going to happen on a day that has south southerly winds. So we're gonna send that smoke over the lake instead of towards those residences. And then wind speed gets important as well um, because that's more of a control issue. We don't wanna pick a day that has really, really high wind speeds because that gives us the, you know, the potential to maybe blow an ember over our control lines. And then we're going to have issues because we have fire outside of our lines. So we only pick days where it's safe to burn via the wind speed. And on that note too, I mean, you want a day that has enough wind because if there's a day that has 
a light and variable or almost no wind, you're going to have a hard time getting that fire to move. And it's going to sit there in one place and it's going to get really, really hot. And that might kill the trees that's sitting there um, where that burn is just, or that fire is just sitting there and getting really hot. So there's these weather parameters and these windows that you have to meet. Um, relative humidity is really important for that too. So you want a day that is basically just dry enough. It can't be too dry for the same reasons where that might have um, some control problems or you might kill trees where you're really not intending to kill trees with most burns. Um, but you don't want it to be too humid either because you're just not going to be able to get a fire to start. I mean, we've been on days where we have 45 or 50 percent humidity and we're sitting there like dumping burn fuel on the ground and we literally can't get the fire to start. So you have to be within those weather parameters too. Uh, fuels and vegetation make a big difference because different fuels are going to burn differently. So like I said, that longleaf pine is going to burn kind of hot because it's drier in nature than an upland um, mixed oak maybe has some sweet gums which are just more moist in nature they don't carry fire as well they don't get as hot and then the last one here is fire lines and resources so going into um, the fire you have to make sure that you have your fire lines set and ready to go before you get there so you need to have 360 perimeter around where you want your fire to be so you can contain that fire and those lines can take on a lot of different forms um, it might be a river on one side. You might just use a leaf blower on another side, but it is important that you have that planned out and you're not just going to assume that the fire isn't gonna cross that river. Before you get there, you need to kind of do ground truthing. And that means going out and walking that whole creek and determining if there is a place that fire may be able to cross it. So a lot of planning goes into that. And then other safety considerations too, um, in the event that something does get hairy or something does go wrong, we have trigger points that are on our prescribed fire plan. Um, and that's kind of what's going to be your point where you need to change your plan. Um, you've got smoke going in a place where it's not supposed to. Maybe there was a big wind shift. Well, now you have to stop your operation. Or maybe you did get a spot fire and it's burning somewhere it's not supposed to. You're going to stop your operation and you need to know who you're going to call. So you have your forest service and your um, local fire departments in your back pocket written on this prescription that's with you um, while you're burning. There's definitely something I'm forgetting here. It'll come to me. All right, so this is the weather activity planner. This is just one tool that we use um, to help us kind of decide when burn days are happening um, and when we can start considering burning. So I put in some of the weather parameters that I wrote into the burn plan for the Lake Johnson burn. These are really wide parameters, probably wider than most people, but that's because we do have access to spot weather forecasts and smoke modeling. So we have a little bit more resources and advantage than a private landowner or a contractor. So we will have a little bit more predictability than the average person, which is why I wrote wide parameters in there. But as you can see, this actually, uh, this week is gonna be a pretty good burn week based on this. Um, all of these colors basically have to align for you to even consider thinking that it might be a good burn day. So Wednesday is out, uh, Thursday's good, Friday is probably good too, as long as you're kind of taking care to make sure you're in these timelines. But it's also important to note that this is just a starting point. It doesn't give you all the information that you need. So what we don't know based on this um, you know, input is if there was maybe three inches of rain that happened on Monday. Well, if there were three inches of rain that happened on Monday, it doesn't matter how good your burn day looks because the soil is gonna be soaked we're not gonna be able to get a fire start, or maybe there's been a drought and we don't have fine fuel moistures here. So this just basically gives us a place to start. And then even that agency cooperation too comes into play. I mean, we're probably not gonna burn on a Saturday or Sunday, realistically. Um, there could be something like the, there's a program running out of the Magnolia Cottage on Thursday. Well, we're not gonna burn while we have a program running out of the Magnolia College or Magnolia Cottage. Or maybe, you know, Julia or Chris isn't gonna be on site one day and we need to have managers there. So this is just a really easy thing to kind of get you thinking, but it also shows a lot of the constraints in um, your burn window. This doesn't, because this is actually kind of hopeful. <laughs> uh, regularly, you'll look at this and you'll be like, oh man, we could burn for like four hours on a Thursday. And that's kind of where we start and how we choose our units. 
this one I wanted to put in here because I had a lot of questions about this when I was out talking to people. So this is our vertical arrangement of fuels. So your ground fuels are below your surface. Those are your tap roots and well, roots in general. We generally don't want to burn any of these because that'll kill trees. Um, and that's what I'm talking about on those days where it's kind of dry and we have no wind. Fire is just going to sit here and it's going to burn into these roots and it's going to kill this tree. We don't want that. Surface fuels are our understory. Um, that's your grasses. It's your dead fuel. It's maybe um, blow down or dead trees on the forest floor. Your ladder fuels are your midstory. So this here says that this can allow fire to travel from surface fuels to aerial fuels. That's unlikely in a prescribed fire situation. We kind of control and make sure that this is going to be a low intensity burn. Um, in a wildfire, that would be true, but in a prescribed fire, we actually generally are trying to burn up some of this midstory. And then your aerial fuels are your tree canopies, your overstory. For our purposes, and in the city of Raleigh, you are never gonna see a prescribed fire that's rolling across the top of the trees. That's a standard placing fire, and we're not gonna do that. There are really specific circumstances that that may be happening if we're trying to replace a stand, but generally we're trying to burn these ladder fuels, um, this, this midstory and the understory. And then, so here at Lake Johnson, why are we burning this site at Lake Johnson? Um, it's a fire prone site. We can kind of figure out that fire would have rolled across this site a lot naturally in history. It's that upland habitat, like I talked about. It's that dry mixed oak um, hickory habitat. It has a south facing slope. So what that means is a south facing slope is going to be drier and warmer in nature than like a north facing or an east facing slope because it gets sun pretty much all day. Um, and the slope itself too is conducive to fire behavior too. Fire moves faster up slope than it does somewhere that's flat or downhill. We also have fire adapted and dependent vegetation over there. There's actually a longleaf pine um, in the stand. It's the only one there, but we do have other longleaf pine stands that are close to that unit. Um, that's a huge red flag that fire would have happened on that site really, really frequently if even a single longleaf pine is standing. And then we have things like blueberries that are coming up too, but they're not doing super great right now because they're being outcompeted and they're not getting the sunlight that they need. So those are all just clues to us that fire would have happened here. And as a recent fire history too. So R.C. Bryant was in, so he was a forestry professor at NCSU and he lived on the property of the Magnolia Cottage and he built that uh, cottage too. And he's kind of one of the pioneers in the modern management and reincorporating fire into our ecosystems. He burned that property over there back in the 70s and 80s when that was still like super controversial. And he got the nickname Burner Bryant because his neighbors did not like that because they were kind of subject to all of that anti-fire propaganda and that misunderstanding of fire. But he actually did really, really good things for the tree stands that are over there, like that uh, longleaf pine ecosystem that's over there that's kind of unusual for the Piedmont. So the overarching, I guess, um, objectives of this burn is habitat restoration. And we're doing that through a few different ways. We wanna reduce the leaf litter there. So we are trying to reduce that, uh, I'm sorry, expose that mineral soil. And we're trying to let some sunlight down in there so that we can have some native vegetation established and reduce fire intolerant saplings. So that's gonna be your more mesic species that are encroaching into that stand. So we have some sugar maples, and sweet gums and beaches that are coming in on that upland stand that really don't belong there. Those are more mesic species and they are not fire tolerant, which means that they have really flaky, really thin bark as opposed to an oak, pine or hickory that has thick bark that protects it from fire. So we wanna reduce all of those and just kind of restore that to be a traditional upland oak hickory ecosystem and increase the establishment of herbaceous ground cover. So by doing that, we are leaving more room and better conditions for wildflowers and grasses and forbs, which provide a really good food resource for animals um, in that area. So what to expect when this burn does happen? Like we said, it, it could be this year. It's trending towards probably happening last or next year. But signage, programming, alerts, and resources for the public. We already have signage up, um, warning people that there kind of is going to be this prescribed fire happening at some point. Programming, just like this, I've been out there a few times doing pop-up programs. Once we do the burn, I plan to be out there and walk people through the burn unit so they can kind of see what it looks like right after a fire and then maybe a few weeks after a fire. 
alerts. As soon as we know when this fire is going to happen, we're going to let you know as soon as possible. Um, there should be texts, notifications on social media, all that, um, but we will give you warning. And then resources for the public. Um, Sean and the marketing department have created this really awesome um, fire web page that I hope Julia can put in the chat if you guys just want more information about it. Um, this should pretty much all be there packaged into that resources web page. Partial trail closures are probably going to be one of the biggest impacts that you feel from this. Um, it is going to be really temporary. This entire burn is two acres. It's only going to take us about a half a day to do, and we're only going to be closing the trails in the places that are closest to the burn during firing operations. So at most, if you're you know, a religious, I walk the trail every Monday to Friday from 11 to 2, maybe you'll be impacted. Otherwise, probably not. Increased agency presence. Um, we are relying on the Forest Service for this, so you are going to see um, Forest Service members, traditional wildland firefighter get-ups, those yellow Nomex and those green pants, um, probably the Raleigh Fire Department, maybe Raleigh Police Department, and then increased park staff too, helping you out with detours. It's definitely going to look like a big to-do. That is only, that that's expected. We're doing that to, um, I guess, reduce any threat that there would be. It's not because there is something that's going wrong that's planned. And then smoke is inevitable. It's no one's favorite part about prescribed fire, um, but it is what it is. It's going to be temporary. It'll feel like a lot of smoke if you are close to the unit, but it's only two acres. It's definitely not enough smoke to impact air quality by any means, but if you are um, sensitive to smoke, you have asthma, you have a respiratory illness or anything like that, I would probably steer clear just that day. Um, the day after that and probably even a few hours after the burn shouldn't be a problem at all. We're going to do a really good job if we call it mopping up and putting up all or putting out all the smoldering materials. And then black ash, charred vegetation, tree scars. Um, this is from the Wilkerson burn. I can admit that it's it's not super pretty after a prescribed fire. Um, it does look like everything kind of died and it looks a little bit desolate, but this is really temporary too. As soon as the wind starts kicking up, we get a rain and some of that vegetation starts coming back in, it's gonna come back lusher than ever. So this is strictly aesthetic um, and it's really temporary. And then what to expect in the future, um, that overarching habitat improvement we talked about, some more native flowers, grasses, this is gonna bring in more wildlife. So if you're a bird watcher, or you like to get out and look for you know, the foxes and deers in the morning, hopefully we'll see a little bit more of that. But what I want to drive home here is this more to come section. Um, it would be futile for us to go out and do a prescribed fire, do all this work, get a prescribed fire on the ground and then wipe our hands of it and then not continue to use fire in the same place again. Again, the fire regime here is frequent low intensity fire and that means that the same place would burn more than once. Um, there's a lot of places in the city of Raleigh that need to burn that I think that Sean has in the works and trying to get fire on the ground there but you will see fires happening in the same places over and over again so in a couple years this lake johnson burn is going to happen again and that's because we want to maintain that habitat we don't want to just kick out some of those sweet gums and reduce the hazard for a couple of years we want to continue to do that and maintain these habitats long term um so that's really all i have i think i left Ooh, i've got good timing i left 10 minutes for questions <laughs> Can I stop screen sharing, Julia? Yep, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So if y'all have any questions, feel free to either throw them in the chat. Um, there's also a raised hand feature that you can utilize um, as well. We are a smaller group, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions you may have. Um, additionally, I did throw that um, uh, resource page. It is a City of Raleigh web page. Um, and so it is a resource page around prescribed fire. One of our goals with that page too is to kind of put information about any other prescribed burns that might be happening within the city of Raleigh. So it's not just Lake Johnson specific. Um, Anyone got questions for Allison? It does it or it could be about the burn here, like that we're hoping for like Johnson, um, what she's studying, what she's kind of experienced with burns. I know you've worked a couple different burns. I guess that was really thorough. That must be it. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, this is Denise. Um, I um, I was listening to the presentation where you were talking about something about um, when to burn, and you were talking about some challenges. Now, I happen to live in the Fayetteville area and have um, worked on some um, kind of like smoke education campaigns um, where we're trying to kind of help people understand what prescribed fire is and how to protect themselves. What um, what additional efforts have you guys been doing? Um, I was kind of cool to see um, the Bob White quail there. Um, so I, I'm just curious what um, what are what are you, you guys ever experiencing? Like for example, um, down here in Ho in Hope County specifically, we learned a lot of people, although they deal with prescribed fire all the time from Fort Bragg, they really have no idea what's going on as far as like local community. So what are you guys doing in terms of kind of educating the community whenever y'all are doing prescribed fire and why it's beneficial? Because y'all are in a more urban environment. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit to that. Um, so within the city of Raleigh, it, prescribed fire is very new. Um, uh, Wilkerson Nature Preserve in North Raleigh did a burn, I think in 2017 was the first burn that the city of Raleigh did. Um, and they, for that one specifically, reached out to their neighbors and did um, a mailer to their neighbors, letting them know that was coming up. Um, they actually burned again, I think last week. Um, and it was the same thing, worked with mailers. For Lake Johnson, because we are very centralized to downtown and have a lot bigger reach. Um, Wilkerson Nature Preserve is near Fort uh, Falls Lake, so they're, they're not as in the heart of the city as we are at Lake Johnson. But one thing we've been really working on is working with our marketing to get that message out. So Allison's been out numerous times doing pop-ups on our trails just to catch the visitors that are there. Um, we've done a lot of programming, so speakers, uh, guest spe um, lectures like this where Allison's come, Allison has come and spoken. Um, we created that resource guide page. So a lot of what we've really worked hard with is working with our marketing team to get that information out there. Um, we have um, yard signs in the park, um, signage up. Um, we we are fortunate with our city marketing team that we have um, a team specifically for our department that had, that manages like social media. So we've been doing some stuff with that. Um, we have various, um, we have an, um, a newsletter that gets sent out to everyone that is interested in like kind of nature education as well as anyone that is interested in learning information about the lake specifically where we've utilized that so one of the biggest things that we've done is really just using the various avenues of communication we have available to us to reach the general public um, and it's reaching those have been well received we have not yet burned to know how much how effective that was um, for our park, I know for Wilkerson specifically, they found that the neighbor uh, mailer worked well, where they um, sent out mailer to like um, the park neighbors to let them know it's coming up and what's happening with that. So we'll definitely be interested to see what happens when we do manage to burn at Lake Johnson as far as like our marketing efforts that we've put forth um, as to like public response to that. Um, cool. Yeah, and I also wanted to point out that one of the reasons that we chose this site to move forward with this like education demo burn and putting out this programming is because that is a super highly trafficked area in the city of Raleigh. So we actually wanted to expose kind of the most amount of people to the burn, but accompanying that with the right kind of education and outreach. Um, and what I've noticed so far I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised in all of the outreach and education I've done is that people are generally on board. I've had a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm so excited that you're getting fire on the ground here. It's a long time coming. And then I've had people that were definitely shocked, but like really, really quick to get on board with it if they were given the information. And I felt like the pop-up programs that I did reached the people that will definitely be exposed to that prescribed fire because they are the people that are using the park frequently. Um, and so I felt I thought that was really effective in talking to them. Yeah, we, we found that too. Once we explained what prescribed fire was, not just, you know, Fort Bragg's on fire, uh, people were like, oh yeah, this is, this is really good. Now, how do I, how do I protect myself? Because there's public health side of that. But, um, but yeah, we, we found that to be the case too down here as well. People are on board with it. Thanks. Anyone else with questions?
Well, if nobody else has questions, um, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you are seeking EE credit, I will be sending out that form um, probably later this week. Um, if not this week, I will definitely get that to you guys first thing next week. Um, additionally, this presentation will hopefully be available um, by early next week. Um, and I will send you guys out with the, the um, form a link to our environmental lecture series playlist on YouTube. So you can rewatch this lecture if you'd like, or as well as watch past lectures that we've um, held um, with recordings on there. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we will be holding another lecture on uh, on May 10th. Um, you can register online the same way you registered for this one. Um, again, it's going to be a free virtual lecture. Uh, we will have Kevin, oh, sorry, uh, probably mispronouncing this last name, but Dockendorf um, from the NC Wildlife uh, Commission. And uh, he'll be speaking to us about uh, uh, fishing, a universal language to conservation re uh, relevancy. Um, so we look forward to having you join us for that one and have a good night. Thanks, everyone.